whether it's a weak and broken or uh, kind of a cafeteria-style theology, or whether it's something solid and more firm, such as a theology based on, uh, uh, like our Presbyterian theology, our Reformed theology, but people will live out what they believe. And, uh, and I find it's very, very important to uh, really try to understand, why do we believe this, and what should I believe, and, and you know, live with uh, a sense of, uh, of wonder about uh, God's ways in the world and God's love in the world. It's so important to know why we do things, but also it's important to share that wonderful gift of the grace of Jesus Christ with our neighbors, our friends, our family, our workmates, our uh, friends at the club, whatever. And especially when they say, you know, I'm really, you know, somebody died in my family. You know, I don't know what to think. You know, is there a God? Is there a heaven? And you can say, well... What I do know is that God is love. And that's where we start in our new tulip. But let's get back to the old tulip here. And uh, just a review of that. And we'll do a deeper review next week as we uh, come to a close. But we have the T-U-L-I-P. Uh, the first one is that, uh, you know, we, we, we sin. And we're, we're never with... Uh, in a situation where we're not without that sinful nature in us, we're, we're, we're as it said, not like ivory soap, uh, 99 and 44, 100 percent pure. But we're never all the way pure. And if we're ever going to do something perfect, uh, that might get us to heaven. But do we? Uh, did I tell you about the uh, sermon series I did based on a book at the church I served in Suffolk? about the big uh, vinyl banner I put out front that said, no perfect people allowed. <laughs> and I did like a six-week series on that based on a book by that name. And, and it was just you know, a good way to uh, get people's attention. And every single week, the same guy in church, after church, he's an elder and all, and, and he would come out and say, I don't like that sign. <laughs> he said, because that means Jesus isn't going to be here today. And I kept saying, it's everybody but, you know. I mean, every Sunday, the same thing. It must have bugged him enough. But every Sunday for the whole series, I don't like that sign. <laughs> Jesus is the only perfect one. <clears throat> uh, God selected certain people to be his believers even before they existed, that election. And then uh, the L for limited atonement, only those who God had chosen, uh, the effects of the cross worked for them, but were ineffective to others, which is a real struggle. People still battle with that one today. How, how, because scripture, we talked about that. Scripture actually kind of says that, but then at other times it says, you know, Jesus died for the sin of the world. Uh, the I, uh, our salvation beginning to end is the work of God, uh, his grace. And we then live into that. But it has nothing to do with our efforts. It's all God. That's the sovereignty principle that's very high in our Reformed theology, where we believe God is sovereign and everything starts with God and we only respond. We're responding to that. We never start it. We never say, oh boy, I think I want to be saved. You know, I think I, you know, really, you know, just out of the blue, it's God working in us, pushing in that direction. And then uh, next week we'll talk about the last one, the perseverance of the saints, uh, the saved. Uh, once saved, always saved is the way the Baptist uh, put that in modern terminology, that once God uh, claims you as God's own, God's not going to drop you, let go of your hand, undo the hug, uh, erase your name from the book of life in heaven. It's, it's there, it's there. So that's the original. I found this little slide when I was doing, uh, putting this together, and I thought it was very helpful just to remind us of uh, what the Synod of Dort was trying to push against which was another form of theology coming from a Reformed theologian, but he was studying Arminius, and he was studying, saying, this just doesn't make sense. 
and he didn't like what they were doing. Then the extreme Calvinists started to come in and started to really set things in stone. You know, they poured the concrete and put the posts in and said, it's there and don't argue if there ever again. So the Calvinism came up with the tulip, but that's what it was going against. They saw a positive view of, of humanity, which also was very similar to the Celtic Christianity that was happening in the northern part of Europe, in Ireland, Scotland, England. Uh, and, they, and they really thought, you know, people weren't that bad. You know, this original sin idea, they kind of went along with it, but they said, you know, people are good. And in the uh, Calvinism time, uh, they used that terminology, depravity, uh, because they really felt things were, uh, you know, people just were not generally good. Uh, they had a very pessimistic view of humanity. And over the, the centuries, a century after uh, Martin Luther and uh, about 70 years after John Calvin, it started to get really tight with their definitions and their understandings. And unconditional election, it just says up there. But I liked the bottom part here. Are you able to see that? Calvinism emphasizes God's providential control. Arminianism, which was the Council of Dort was going against, uh, emphasizes human free will and the responsibility for us to make a decision or to obey. And then I, I really like that last line there. For by grace you have been saved through faith. That's from Ephesians. And I like that very, very last line there. Calvinists emphasize grace, while Arminians emphasize faith. What you do, the response, the trust, the total trust that you give to God. And, and I just kind of like that. But what does the sentence before it actually say? Is it one or the other? It's both together. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But as I've been saying each week, I think it's time that we maybe uh, emphasize a few other theological doctrines in our day and age to make the gospel more inviting to people that we know, or even to us. And uh, that's where we got the triune love, unselfish election, limitless reconciliation, inspiring grace, what we're going to talk about today, and passionate, persistent saints. I didn't make these up. They come from the book that is holding up the projector here. Uh, it's called A Generous Orthodoxy by Brian McLaren. And in that book, he challenges uh, a number of denominations to upgrade or refresh their emphasis in theology. And these are his words. And I just took each one and said, well, what would that really mean in an everyday Presbyterian church? And that's where the book comes out. And we start with Trinitarian love. That's where you always start with the love of God, the agape love, the unconditional love of God. God's going to love us. Uh, his steadfast love endures forever. I put you through that terrible exercise of just doing the repeat back of God's steadfast love endures forever. Uh, and they, you know, Psalm 136, it just does it until you're, you're just beaten down and say, okay, I give up. I guess your love endures forever. And, and that's where we are with that. That's the most, I think that's the best thing to share with other people is God's love. We love you. Now you don't stop there. But that's where you begin, with God's love for you, God's love for the world. God loves you in that Mr. Rogers way, you know, just the way you are. But then it doesn't stop there either because there's, but God wants you to grow in your love, grow in your faith, grow in your understanding. But the God loves you just where you are. That's where you begin. And then the U was unselfish election, if you remember. And that's a fresh approach to uh, chosenness. If you remember the, uh, the, the story of Abraham, we went into the being, uh, you know, you're blessed to be a blessing. And a lot of people just stopped at, you're blessed. And isn't that great? You're going to go to heaven. You're elected. You're chosen. And you're one of my special people. Isn't that wonderful? And then you look at other people and, 
you kind of, nah, you're not, you know, you're not gone, you're not gone. <laughs> And it can, and, and I've known people that have that sense of, you know, I'm better than you because I'm chosen. And really the biblical truth behind that, uh, it's not that this is wrong, the biblical truth behind that is that you're blessed to be a blessing. There's a purpose to that. There's a godly purpose to that. We see that here, the chosenness, that all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and the understanding of that is that somebody else is blessed and then they go on to be a blessing to others and they go on to be a blessing to others and 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 the family of faith grows and grows and grows and grows and grows and when God blesses you he has more in mind than just you I think that's something you know if I had a tattoo maybe that's what I'd put on just to remind myself of that all the time. Because if God blesses me, it's the, I'm not the end user of God's blessings. It's designed to be passed on. And we're going to build on that tonight as we think about the irresistible grace. The next one was limitless reconciliation. Something that is in unlimited supply in God's economy is forgiveness and reconciliation. And we get that through the Bible. Uh, you, you know, it begins with forgiveness. God forgives you. And we are challenged to forgive others. Is that easy? No. But it's still our challenge. How many times? An endless amount of times. That's what the 70 times 7, the perfect numbers. Uh, it's not that you actually count up to 490, then stop. Uh, if you do that, well... Your works are wonderful. <laughs> it's still not going to get you to heaven. But, uh, and, and this is the text from 2 Corinthians that, that we, you know, we were once, uh, another text that we were once enemies, now we've been made friends. But what does that mean? We are now put in the position to be challenged. This is our call. This is our job as Christians to be friend makers for God, to be reconcilers for God. And that means, you know, to share God's love and forgiveness of others. But we do that as well by word and deed. But then we also have to forgive others. And that's not easy to do. It's not easy to do. Sometimes, you know, you do it and it's a real surprise. And people say, oh, I was just waiting, you know, I was just waiting for you to ask, you know, for my forgiveness. Of course I forgive you. And, and there's a, that reconcile it reconciliation but other times if you remember there was a slide that I had from last time it said something about uh, forgiving someone who was never going to apologize or something like that you know you just understand that it's not going to happen but you have to release that and give that put it on Jesus shoulders and just get it off of your shoulders because uh, living a life of unforgiveness of you and, and sometimes it's so so hard uh, it's just so, so hard. Tonight we're going to deal with the, uh, the new eye, but we're going to go over the old eye, and that is irresistible grace. Our salvation from beginning to end is the work of God's grace, and it is not of our doing. And for a lot of folks, that's hard to to stomach, maybe because you're in a Presbyterian situation, a Reformed uh, uh, mindset that, yeah, that's good, I'm okay. But you can actually see there's a lot of good arguments for this one. And this is where we also get into predestination. Uh, this one here that, uh, you know, we were elected and chosen, but it had nothing to do with us that we have been made children of God that it's always from the outside in. Our salvation from beginning to end is of God's work. Other people say, well, it begins with God, but it ends with me because I have to accept that gift and all. And we went over some of that last week with the atonement. And my thought is it's a both and. But back in the old days, 
This was very, very important. Why? Because they believed that the church at the time, the Roman Catholic Church at the time out of Rome, uh, believed that it was the church who could say who was in and who was out of the blessings, the favor, the salvation of God or of your heavenly home. So it was human beings who were actually the beginning and end of your salvation because they would say, it's up to me if you're going to go to heaven or not. And then they had all these different ways that would prove that you're going to go to heaven. And they'd ask for money at church. You know, they'd pass the offering around and keep track of that, just like we do. But we don't do it for that reason. We do it for tax purposes. Uh, and But they'd say, you know, go on pilgrimage uh, and you'll you know, have works that you'll get you into heaven or out of purgatory, that holding space where you pay for your sins after death. But, you know, as if Jesus didn't do that already, why are you still doing it there? That's the argument for that. Actually, the church has kind of gotten rid of some of that, the Catholic church. They did get rid of limbo, the theology, the, uh, the doctrine of limbo, where a child unbaptized went you know, if the child dies, they didn't go to heaven. They went to some, you know, other place called limbo. They actually, you know, Pope came out and said, that's not, that's not what we believe anymore. And then the purgatory is another one that they're kind of lightening up on. They're, but again, it's, it's 400 years after the Reformation when we, you know, when the Protestants then kind of pushed all that stuff aside. That was all church teaching, uh, this is what the Westminster Confession says. And this is our Presbyterian longer, uh, the long confession of faith that the shorter catechism is based on. But this is from the confession. And it says, all those whom God hath predestined unto life. You like that old English stuff? And those only, only those who have been predestined. If you remember, you go back to the, the you the unconditional election. God chose you before the foundation. Only those God chose. God is pleased in his appointed time effectually to call by his word and spirit out of that state of sin and death, our salvation, in which they are by nature to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ. And that is that irresistible grace. It's only those who have been selected, chosen, elected, will have the irresistible grace. The grace of God will be effective for them, but not for others. And that becomes, that's where this one here, you could talk about predestination. Well, so God chose me, but what about the anybody else? What about all those who, uh, well, it really doesn't matter because the uh, one argument was, well, you know, how about the Jew, our Jewish cousins? They don't really hear about Jesus Christ, you know, in everyday life. Uh, how about those who lived before the time of Jesus? How would they, you know, what happened to their eternal destiny? And what happens to the, uh, you know, we worked with a, a missionary when I was in Suffolk who was down in Papua New Guinea, and they didn't even have uh, the language to speak to some of these tribes out in the rainforest. And one of his jobs, this missionary, was to translate the Bible into these dialects. But until they could even speak that dialect, what happened to all those folks? Is that the Howards? No, no. It, these weren't Presbyterians, so you pro it probably wasn't. It was, a, it was somebody that somebody knew whose dad was a missionary, and he was a partner of... His dads and no, I think they worked with them, but it was a different organization. Oh, but then they, they got a friend down there. We support a friend of this guy. Is he still there? Possibly. I'm not sure if he is or not. I, I've been out of the loop of that one. We we kind of parted ways uh, about halfway through my ministry there, and we started su supporting. Uh, uh, Don over at the Presbytery office and uh, his group over there, really good. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember. Uh, Presbytery. We started them because the guy went on to administration. This missionary went on to be an administrator, and we didn't want to sponsor the administrator. We wanted 
People wanted people out in the field. So, so we kind of lost track of them. Could you read that as all those whom God has predestined unto life? Meaning anybody who's alive? Anyone who God I think it means uh, eternal life. Yeah, well, I know, but, but you could read it that God, you know, is, is brought to life. For any, any, anyone who's alive. It's very hard to read in, in that old English yeah. style. Uh, but it is, it's talking about eternal yes. life or uh, sanctified life, saved life, yeah. using kind of some of the modern words. But I mean, I mean, this goes back, that was written in the middle of the 1600s uh, by Presbyterians, Scottish, and the Pilgrims, the Congregationalists and all, and as well as the Church of England who ended up backing out from the uh, Westminster Confession of Faith. And Presbyterians took that on as ours, and it's still uh, our central uh, statement of faith now, although we have we in, we're more open to interpretation of it rather than a strict you know you believe this if so you're in if not you're out and there were no scruples is what that was that's called in church government terms if you have a scruple against one of these uh claims you can claim a scruple the minister or an elder or a deacon in fact uh when you take your ordination vows and if the scruple is something minor, well, I, I just don't, you know, this or that little thing. But sometimes the scruples were so big, such as, well, at one time it was, well, I don't believe uh, Jesus, uh, the virgin birth was a big argument back in the 1920s with the fundamentalists and the modernist debate. And, and that was a scruple you would take. And in modern times, it was on... Uh, the uh, homosexuality and there was a scruple they say I just can't handle that uh, and before that time it was women ordination as elders deacons and ministers and ministers could raise a scruple saying you know scripture says one thing you know the church says another and and then they would argue and debate whether that was enough to keep a person from ordination or being accepted into a new presbytery if you were a minister moving. And Steve might remember, there were some hefty debates. I was in Central Florida at that time, uh, which had a very strong, very conservative Presbyterian presence. In fact, First Church of Orlando, uh, after their minister that I work with there left, uh, they brought in a new minister and they actually left the denomination uh, over some of these scruples, I mean, a huge church. It was, you know, on TV, kind of like the Baptist church here on TV, Sunday morning and all. And they left the denomination over a scruple, something they felt was not, they, they could not accept a newer interpretation of things. And, uh, and in, in our day and age, it, we've kind of, I don't know if Steve will, Maybe somebody else, if you're ever on committee on ministry, uh, you know, we've kind of lowered the, the bar a whole lot of, of that. And, and in some ways, that's good. In other ways, you know, you kind of, you know, what's going to happen three years from now? Or, you know, is that church going to leave the denomination over something? Or are they going to be, uh, you know, radicalized or something like that? So it's, it's, it's a real hard call. Uh, especially in our culture today. It's just very, very difficult in our culture today to, uh, to uh, express beliefs and then hold on to them when other people have so many strong beliefs. That's something different. <laughs> Here's some texts that uh, I think are helpful when we think about the irresistible grace of God. Uh, the first one is from Romans and you are justified by his grace, the irresistible grace, and that's a gift. It's nothing you did to deserve it through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It happened on the cross. That's a gift to you. You, can't, you didn't earn that. And then John, no one can come to the Father unless the Father who sent me draws them. It's God bringing us to Christ in salvation. So these are very biblical things, and that's where um, 
the, the song from uh, the Amazing Grace song, uh, John Newton wrote, "'Twas grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home." Just grace. He's not talking about, and my faith is going to lead me home. He said, no, it's grace that brought me here, you know, to the foot of the cross. And it's grace that's going to lead me through the rest of this life all the way home to heaven. I mean, he just, it's pure and simple, good reformed theology grace. The great evangelist, Charles Spurgeon. We believe that the work of regeneration, conversion, sanctification, and faith is not an act of man's free will and power, but of the mighty effectiveness, uh, efficacious and irresistible grace of God, the effective grace, the irresistible grace. Now, he came from a Baptist tradition. Is that correct? Do you remember? I know. Uh, I Was he a denomination? Presbyterian. He was raised Presbyterian, but kind of went into the evangelical frontierism. Uh, and he became really a, 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 one of the best evangelists, you know, Billy Graham style evangelists. Him and Dwight Moody, and they all kind of are in that huge, huge, huge pantheon of great evangelists. But he was a, a five point Calvinist, and this is one of them. He just said, you know, it's grace, it's nothing you do. Irresistible grace. It's all about grace. R.C. Sproul, a uh, reformed theologian on the conservative side of uh, our, um, our many Presbyterian denominations. And he says, does God drag some people kicking and screaming into his kingdom while preventing others who desperately want to be saved? That's, that's where the challenge comes. And I'm happy to be Draw, uh, drawn into uh, the faith because I because of that being drawn into the faith I feel like maybe I've been elected to do that maybe I'm one of God's children but how about all these people who might want to but they're not chosen and the, the grace pushes the saved in but keeps the others out there's an irresistible push that's insinuated in this doctrine. There's a pull to pull the elect in, but there's a push to keep others out. And that's the struggle. That's the, that's the struggle that we have when we fall heavily on irresistible grace without looking at a wider view of scripture and the, uh, and the, the message of the gospel. Shuts the door to a lot of people. That's what when when Presbyter when Calvinists got really extreme, hard nosed Calvinists. That's what they would say. Well, it's don't blame me. That's what it says in the Bible. You know, blame God. You know, I didn't design the, I didn't design the the system. It's all God's. I'm just living it out. And th and that's where, you know, if you're really a hard nosed believer of that that's where it would lead that you know don't blame me but that's how it is you know some there's a good number of people aren't going to be saved go to heaven you're not going to see them in heaven which is heartbreaking isn't it when you think of relatives who may you know been nominal christians or something and you think you know i'm going to see them you know you know if they were hard-nosed christians my parents wouldn't be in heaven because they were roman catholics and they were trying to work their way into heaven. And of course we know it's all God, not our works. So I'm sure they're out. They're not in heaven. I'm not going to see them when I die. Although I think I'd love to have it be my dad and mom coming to be the ones to meet me. You know, come on in, come on in. The weather's fine. Yeah, you think it's nice today? What would you do? Come to God and Jesus and the faith later on in life. I mean, that's, that's next, next week. week. <laughs> <laughs> Perseverance of the saints. That's the argument for next week, though, uh, of the old argument. But that was very important then because...
just as your answer, we're you know, talking about that. Uh, it was the church who decided who was really saved and who was just kind of going along for the ride. And that was the, uh, you know, the church would say, you're in or out. Uh, but it's not just you're, you can't come to church on Sunday. It was, if you couldn't come to church on Sunday, you also weren't going to heaven. And in those days, as somebody, I forget who it was, I don't know if it was Ann or somebody else, was saying, you know, back in the time, you know, in the 1600s, you know, life and death issues were so much more in your face than they are today. You know, hunger, well, you look at Ukraine, imagine, you know, that everywhere. You know, wars, starvation, you know, everywhere. You know, you had to work every day to get your food unless you were some elite, you know, king or queen. Then you had to worry about having your head. Uh, it was very different back. So for them, it, you know, birth, you know, most, you know, so many amount of children, I don't know the statistics, but so many amount of children wouldn't live beyond the age of five. So people had as many children as you can. And then with how many having pregnancies with no medical care, the moms died and, uh, you know, in pregnancy or some kind of complex, you know, the whole, it was every day had the, the plague came through. We think, you know, the pandemic is a, for us, it's a, uh, a big thing. But can you imagine the bubonic plague coming to your city with no preventive medicine or even understanding of it? You know, they thought the Jews brought it in, so they kicked all the Jews out of one of the, I forget what city it was in Europe, but I think it was in uh, Italy, maybe. But they, they actually gathered up all the Jews and kicked them out. And because it was rumored that it was the Jews who brought the plague. Did you know the backstory of that? No. What's the backstory? Uh, in Leviticus, they got all the rules about how you have to clean your dishes. You cannot use dishes with cracks. All that sort of thing. You got 35 different rules on how to wash your hands. So they didn't get sick because they used clean mm. dishes. They were very careful about what they ate, how it was prepared, and they washed their hands. And so there, this whole group of people, none of them got sick. And everybody else over here eating from dirty dishes. And, you know, I washed my hands six months ago when I took on you know, two baths a year. Uh, they were getting sick. And so what is, you know, what's with these people? Why are they immune? They must have power over it. Maybe they're giving it to us. Yeah, they're and so trying to was, get rid of us. The whole thing about that was that the Jews were just living by their code, by Leviticus. Interesting, yeah. I did hear that something, something like, like that when I was doing reading one time of Middle Eastern or Middle Ages history. And uh, it did say, you know, they... No, they thought the Jews brought it and were spreading it, so they got rid of the Jews. That was a, an answer, but it didn't help anything. Everybody continued to die, so it didn't really do anything. But, I mean, that's the mentality of that day. And uh, so life and death issues were in your face at that time. So thinking about death, you know, we tend to, you know, the older folks, you know, they're getting closer. So they start to think about it once in a while. You know, their friends start passing away and they read the obituary and there's you know more people in the obituary that you start knowing but in that day you know everybody it was a life and death situation every day so your status in heaven was extremely important and who chooses that is it the church especially at the time you know there's a lot of corruption in the church uh, a lot of politics in the church uh a lot of hypocrisy in the church. You know, why, why would they be the ones? So that's where the Reformation came into that. Um, let's move on. Uh, let me just share this with from R.C. Sproul. I thought it, this is interesting, as looking at the older tradition. Indeed, we are capable of resisting God's grace, he says. We're, we're able to resist God's grace. So it's not irresistible, is it? But then he goes on to say, because he's a good uh, reformed theologian, and we do resist God's grace. 
But the idea here is that in spite of our natural resistance to the grace of God, that God's grace is so powerful that it has the capacity to overcome our natural resistance, our, our hum, human resistance to it. That's why he prefers the term effectual grace rather than irresistible. Because this grace that is irresistible affects what God intends to do. So for him, it would be tulep, T-U-L-E-P. Uh, because he thinks it's uh, effectual. It's, it's what happens, the effect it has. Um, and, and as I said a little earlier, the church does not choose who is saved or not, who will go to heaven or not. This was uh, good news to the church of the Reformation age, as we just talked about. We can't be holy enough to meet God's criteria for salvation. That was that first, that's the T, the total depravity. Uh, only Christ's death on the cross accomplishes that. That's the, um, the L, the atonement, the limited atonement. But the question comes up, can we resist God's grace or turn down the offer of salvation from what we just heard about, the irresistible grace? Is that possible? Well, some say yes, and some traditions say no. The older Presbyterian Reformed tradition says, no, you can't, you can't turn down God's grace. If God really wants you, God's going to get you. In other traditions, such as Arminianism, that uh, came, the Wesleyan Church picked up on that. Uh, and, and they say, yeah, you could resist God's grace. You have a choice in the matter. You could turn your back on God. Steve had a good uh, quote. What was that about hell and heaven? You make your own hell or? Oh, the C.S. Lewis quote that uh, there are those who prefer to be their own little gods in hell than to serve the one true God in heaven. To be your own little God in hell than to serve a big God in heaven. Uh, and and C.S. Lewis came out of the Church of England. So he had more of an Arminian uh, understanding because the Wesleyan church, Charles John Wesley came out of the Church of England as this big revivalist time, but the theology continued through. For grace is given not because we have done good works, but in order that we may be able to do them, said St. Augustine. There's a purpose to all this again. Similar to the uh, the, the I in, uh, or the you in uh, the blessing part. There's a purpose to it. There's a purpose to grace. Now I added a little line on the bottom here. And this is our next chapter here. We turn the page. Because even though some say yes and some say no to this, we modern day Presbyterians say both and. It's grace and faith working together. Because that's what we see in scripture. It's both and. We see God's work behind the scenes drawing people to God's self. And we also find people who have this real hunger for God. And are there, it's an insatiable hunger until they find God. And as St. Augustine said... Uh, in another place, our hearts, now I can't go, our, well, basically our hearts, are, uh, he said, our hearts are restless until we find rest in thee. And you get down to that, you know, our heart, we have a hole in our heart, the shape of God, and it's only filled when God comes and fills that in our hearts. That's the only thing that's going to make us really whole. But again, when we say both and, it becomes a paradox. And here's some fun paradoxes here. The first one is the quirky, 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 the typewriter paradox. No keyboard detected? Press one. Oh, I don't have, you know, what, what are you telling me? I like the Pinocchio one. My nose will grow. If this is true, it won't grow. It's God's sovereign love and 
our strong desire for God. And that strong desire of God, I do not say it's all us. I see that as that wonderful, invisible presence of Christ working behind the scenes. Uh, the Methodists call it provenient grace, moving us, kind of pushing us, wooing us to open our hearts and our lives to God. So it's kind of a coming together, a meshing, a melding of both. But our desire for God also comes not just because we're human beings, but there's something going on behind the scenes. And I think God is very capable of doing that for everybody in the world, whatever religion, whatever. That God, you know, we're not the chosen ones here. I think God works behind the scenes trying to get everybody. Hey, why, you know, if we have a loving God, that triune God, I really think that's something that's not beyond God's capability. If God is someone totally other than us, and we cannot even fathom probably an ounce of all that God is in all this time. I like the Mother Teresa one. Do you see that one? Do you like that one? A nice paradox. It's a mystery of faith, just like the Trinity. And I was doing research, I came across this real neat little thought by one of the theologians uh, that said, uh, when you come to one of these mysteries of faith, don't think the job is going to try to answer or find the right answer to that mystery. Because when there's a mystery in the faith, it's not to find the answer or to solve the mystery. The mystery is there to show that God loves you so much that God wants you to dive in and find all the complexities and the paradox and all the, uh, the, the, the mix and mash of things that is found in Scripture and, and how to kind of put it together without actually ending up getting to an answer. You know, the cross of Christ means X, Y, Z. And if you don't believe that, then you're going to hell. I mean, right now in our day and age, uh, and there's a lot of uh, writings about this, uh, there are dozens of theories of the atonement. What happened on the cross? And some people say, well, God demanded blood, a blood sacrifice to uh, because sin was rampant in the world and only blood sacrifice could be done by a pure uh, sacrifice, such as the lamb without blemish, if you remember. Uh, so they said, let's bring that into human realm and God's realm. God demanded a pure, perfect sacrifice. And the only one in the world that ever was able to satisfy that was who? Jesus. Remember the guy, you know, no perfect people allowed? He was angry because he said, well, Jesus is perfect, so we can't have him at church. No, well, Jesus was perfect, and he was that perfect sacrifice. Nobody else would meet that because of tulip, of the tea. That, and people say, that's what you need to have. And some denominations are arguing that today. But there are many other theories of the atonement. One is that perfect love. That sacrificial, unconditional, agape love that Jesus showed by offering himself on the cross destroyed evil. Now, evil is still there, but in the end, evil is not going to win. But because that sacrifice on the cross out of pure love changed the whole world from that moment on. It went from B.C. to A.D. Everything changed. And others, and, and there's, I don't want to get into, I don't even understand a lot of them because they're so nuanced. But there's dozens of these theories of atonement, what happened on the cross. And for good Presbyterians, we say, yes. Oh, that's, yes. Is that a biblical understanding? Yes. Is that something you could prove from, yes, thank you. I have this faceted jewel of theology. You know, when you have a jewel, think of a, a diamond on a ring, but you hold it this big in your hand, you know, the Hope Diamond. It has all these different facets that are cut, and it sparkles 
when you move it in certain directions, and it depends on what direction you move it, what facet you know reflects the light and sparkles, it makes it look so wonderful. Well, that's how it is with the atonement, what happened on the cross. Depends what question you ask of it is the answer you get. So you could ask one question and get a different answer. Yes, Jesus died on the cross as a sacrifice, pure sacrifice. Yes. And I can't do that. He had to do it for me. They say, well, what happened on the cross? Wasn't Jesus love? Yes, and love offered itself unconditionally, agape love, on the cross. And that destroyed evil. The power of evil, I should say. To overcome. The light overcomes the darkness, and the darkness has never overcome the light. The light always wins. And, and on and on. So it depends on what question you ask. And, and that's the same thing with the Lord's Supper, the same thing with baptism. There's no one thing. It depends on what you're asking. What's, what's communion on Sunday mean? Other than people who like the bread and buy it at the talent show for 15 bucks. And, and I brought it home and Debbie ate it. This is the best bread. That was so good. I said, it's communion bread. She goes, I knew it. <laughs> That's why she was here on Sunday, so she could have a piece of that bread, because we're all done with the loaf. But communion and, and baptism, both the sacraments, are these mysteries, holy mysteries. Same with this. The idea of grace, or is it my faith? Or is it God's grace? It's both and, depending on what you're getting at. Where are you in life? What's important? And, you know, are you struggling with your faith? Maybe you could lean on the grace part. You know, I don't have to struggle anymore, even if I have doubts, even if I, you know, have a lot of questions, even if I just am having a real hard time believing that God really loves me and forgives me. Well, lean on grace. God loves you just the way you are. God loves you whether you like it or not. Or, you know, if you're wondering, you know, the other way, you know, you lean on faith. You know, I, I know God loves me, but I just, I got to do something. I don't know. So step out in faith and use your faith. Though, you know, it depends on what you're getting at, where you are in life, what's going on in your spiritual life and your spiritual walk. And that's where Presbyterians kind of have this both and. It's a paradox. And this is my quote down here. You don't get too many of mine. God loves you so much that you're in perceptively drawn to faith. That's the grace side. We don't even understand. But imperceptibly, we're drawn to faith. While at the same time, you have such a desire to know God, you hunger for it, that amazing grace. And then you seek it out. You know, why are you hungry for a God? Where does that come from? Is that, are you born with that hunger for God? Some people say yes. Others say, no, nah, I think that's God working behind the scenes, you know, giving you some hunger pains here. You know, giving you an appetite for God. And then you go out and you, you search it out and you become part of Fairfield Church. Contemporary Christian thought strives to live within the tension of these two biblical truths, even though they seem to be expressing opposite realities. That's the paradox of faith. That's that holy mystery. You're laughing at the picture, aren't you? Yes, paradox. <laughs> <laughs> Takes a while sometimes. <laughs> what? What? Paradox. It's a mystery of faith. You don't look for the right answer or the one answer. But it's a call to dive deeply into the mystery of God's world of triune love. It's a both and. And that's where we are today. That's what we're trying to uh, express today. Uh, that that's where modern Presbyterian Reform thought is right now. And uh, we said this before, but it, it leads to predestination. 
And then double predestination. Well, if God, you know, if I can't resist it, how come somebody else did? Well, you were the one that was chosen. So God's making grace irresistible to you, but not to somebody else. Well, then that doesn't seem real fair, does it? It doesn't seem very loving. It seems very judgmental. And I'd say predestination is the only Christian doctrine in which we have to look backward to understand. You look back over your life and see, you know, I really do see God moving me in one direction or another. Even when, I, when, it, even when it seemed like I might be ignoring or fighting God's will in my life, somehow it brought me to where I am today. And maybe that fight, that struggle, that low point, that pain... Maybe that's what God is using today in your life to be able to share your faith with others, to literally say, yeah, I've been there, I've done that. But, but, let me tell you about the triune love of God and how you're, you know, the blessings you have today, they're not for you, they're, you know, you can enjoy them, but then you have to pass them on. That's what they're designed for. And God forgives you, you know, 70 times 7. Unlimited amount of time. The perfect numbers. And there's a grace that's going on in your life, and that's what we're going to get into right now. But before we do that, I want to who can sing? Anybody know that tune? Oh, Debbie. Can you? Yeah, I don't know. I don't even know if it's a real tune. It just was something I found when I was looking up, you know, Amazing Grace. And this thing popped up. Now, the, the Ephesians is up there. It's a gift from God. But I like this little ditty here. I sought you, Lord, but now I see you are the one who is seeking me. And that's where that looking back, that predestination doctrine you look back. You say, I was searching you and I, you know, I was looking all over. I went from church to church. I tried some other religions. I went to the Baha'i temple and I, you know, I watched something online, some new age. And, and I tried these churches and I came to Fairfield Church and, and that's where I found you, Lord. And three years later to going, you know something, you know, I was seeking, it was really God who was seeking me and brought me to this place. your faith and your testimony to others because you can say I can see where you led me to this point and we're and you're talking with someone who is struggling and you can say well this is what happened to me and if you hold on to God it will happen to you too and you will see it and that looking back and seeing your life, that is a very strong testimony. It's probably one of the strongest, and most powerful testimonies people have. You know, you should have saw, you know, I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now, now I, I see. see. We could play, play that video, video again if you want. If you twist my arm, we could go back to next, last week because that video was very powerful. So we're up to uh, the new tulip. Inspiring grace instead of irresistible grace. How about if grace inspires us to do something for God? It's a fresh focus, I think, that will uh, attract people's attention. Uh, not saying the, uh, the old one is wrong or unbiblical. That's, that's just deeper theology. You learn that as you go along. But if you want to you know, talk to somebody, you know, inspiring grace is a great way to think about it and we'll get into that uh what is grace this is this is old hat for you guys i know grace is when you get the good things you don't deserve and what's mercy or god's love mercy is when you are spared from the bad things that you deserve and and i like what they say it says god is gracious in both grace makes no exception i'm not what i've I'm not what I've done. And if I claim that as true, and this is the catch, I must also claim as true the others. That is true in others. So if it's not what I've done, 
you know, I, I've messed up so many times. I mean, you know, as a kid, you know, I got into so much trouble. Uh, and, and so many times I got out of trouble by a, a cat's whisker. I mean, that, you know, and like other people get in trouble and, and I wouldn't. And, and if I got in trouble, my life probably would have taken a different turn than it did. You know, my parents would have treated me differently. Relatives probably would have treated me differently. My friends, teachers, you know, if they only knew what I did. You know, I was, I was a little devil child, I guess. <laughs> uh, not that bad, but. Uh, and then in teenage years, uh, and then, then just, you know, once I became a Christian, uh, an active Christian, you know, I tried to clean up my act. Matter of fact, I cleaned up my act a whole lot uh, at that moment in time when I was 20 years old. And, and, but everything changed. But as I, you know, look back, I messed up so many times, so many times. Hurt people's feelings without even knowing it, you know. Uh, it's bad, you know. Leave things out and you get, you know, something messes up, uh, you know, from big to little things. Uh, but if that's not what saved me, it was God's grace that saved me. Then when I look at other people, and of course we tend to be more critical of other people, don't we? We judge ourselves on our good intentions. Well, I know I messed up, but I really didn't mean it. You know, I really meant it to be, you know, we judge ourselves on our good intentions while others judge us on our last bad decision. And, and that's just how it goes. But if their decisions or bad behavior, even just their whole life, you know, if that's not going to do it, then if it doesn't do it for me, I have to claim it for them. And that's a powerful, that's a powerful idea to, to, to think about. Paul Tripp wrote, I think my job is to make the grace of an invisible God visible. Wherever I am. That's our job. When we think about inspiring grace. It's to make that invisible grace of God visible through our lives that could reach other people for a purpose. Inspiring grace is purposeful grace. Brian McLaren in the, in the book that uh, he, he talks about that. This is about all he talks about in inspiring grace. This is what kind of jumped me off he, uh, onto my thoughts about it. He says, a kinder, gentler gospel for the 21st century would view God's, that's supposed to be grace, not France. That's, <laughs> that's spell check for you. I did change it on my other computer, but it didn't get to this one. That's my failure, you see. I'm not perfect. I've just proved it. So stop telling your friends I'm perfect. Uh, uh, the view God's grace as passionate, powerful, personal desire of the triune God to shower the church with healing and joy and every good thing. And having received this grace, here's our job, having received it freely and fully, the church would then be inspired by grace to truly, to freely and fully extend that grace to others in an overflow of good works and acts of kindness and mercy, yielding a truly, and this is the name of his book, Generous Theology. It would be a very generous, uh, generous orthodoxy, sorry. And that's his desire to have a generous orthodoxy rather than a constricting or judgmental way that the church is acting. And we do that so often because of our denominational and theological differences. He wants to spread that out and say, is there a way to be generous in our understanding of people? And he helps us do that. Yes, Anne? that say, we will tell you whether you are saved or not. Sure. We'll tell you if you get to go to heaven. Yes. We don't have to yes. I, I will tell you the story of that, that missionary. To answer your question was, are there churches today that still are very constrictive to their understanding that they have the right answer or the right gospel and everybody else is outside of the fold? And that missionary... Uh, that we uh, discontinued supporting. He went on to be an administrator. We didn't do that. His daughter came to our church who was in a missionary, very conservative 
uh, fundamentalist uh, group. Uh, and she was a young adult going into mission field. And she came to our church and asked the session as well as the Presbyterian women for support. And we knew her from her dad because they visited our church, stayed at people's homes and all. So, you know, as a young teen now, she was 20 something years old and she was going out on her own. Well, she showed us her flyers and all from the church she was, or the denomination she was involved with for, that was sending her away. And we read that at session and we said, I guess we're not Christian. Because it said on there, we had to believe all these different things to be Orthodox Christians. And about, I think there were like 10 things that we we're supposed to believe without question. And if you didn't believe them, you were outside the fold of Jesus Christ. And we probably missed nine out of 10, other than Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And I don't know, even know what denomination. It wasn't even the denomination of her dad. She was got caught up in another denomination. I guess she, you know, for her it was a calling, a job that she, you know, found a, a calling to do and got involved with this group. But for her, that was fine. She believed it all. So was that a, I, a cult? No, it was just a very, very constrictive denomination that believed like that Westminster con uh, Confession said, you know, like if you went with that, only the elect are going to heaven. They're only going to feel that grace. Everybody else is outside the boat. They're, you know, they're, they're sinking in the water. That's, but that was just, you know, 15 years ago or so. And I'm sure they haven't changed. Uh, and we all looked at each other. We can't support that. We're not going to give somebody money who doesn't believe we're in the Christian family. We're not going to give the congregation's money to someone who says, you guys are going to hell. And some of the women of the church individually gave her money to support her mission. But the organizations didn't. But yeah, they're out there all over. You see them on TV a lot. You know, they're, they're ones that have the, the reach and the money to present. And if you get into them, you know, you'll find what do they believe. And if you don't believe that, you're not considered an Orthodox Christian. You're in some sect over here. We're in the Presbyterian sect, I guess. You know, something outside the norms. Heretics. It actually said we were heretics. But it said if you do not believe all these, you're a heretic and not going to heaven and all this. I mean, it was very blatant. Was it very superficial beliefs? No, it was. You had to believe in the virgin birth was one of them, and our, you know, our denomination doesn't lift that up as a, uh, as something you must believe in. You know, you could understand it in different ways that Jesus' birth was miraculous and all, but that's, you know, that might have been one that most people at session would say, yeah, that's fine. But not everybody. But that's not going to keep you from being ordained an elder. Yeah, I know there are groups that think you can pick up snakes and they're not going to hurt you. That's another oh. one. That wasn't on there, but <laughs> <laughs> we don't have that in our book of confessions either. <laughs> there, there are some. That wouldn't happen to me. <laughs> I was going to say there are some Pentecostal groups that would say if you don't speak in tongues, you haven't had the second baptism. And so therefore you're not a Christian. If you have not had the, the second baptism of, of being anointed by the Holy Spirit and speaking tongues and have the and, uh, spiritual gifts, spiritual prophecy, gifts. And yeah, yeah. So they would say that uh, those of us, as as an old friend of mine would say, the, the, the distinction he always made the distinction between the charismatics and the mellows, and those <laughs> of us who, who are mellows, <laughs> mellows. <laughs> would not be considered Christians. Yeah, there's yeah, there's quite a lot that would say you're outside the norm. Even in the Roman Catholic Church today, I'm not, even though I grew up Catholic, I'm not allowed to receive communion because I've dropped away and I'm yeah. sure uh, they have, you know, relaxed a lot of their standards, but the closed communion is not one of them. I'm sorry, just remind me of a funny story. The, 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 uh, 
the Catholic Church in Wyalusing when I was serving there uh, was uh, re sanctioned And, and my colleague, who was a dear, dear friend of mine, invited myself and the two other Protestant ministers in town to come and be a part of that. And as we were waiting in the in the rectory to get uh, before the service, we brought our robes and everything else. <clears throat> and the uh, the bishop's assistant says, "Okay, it's time time for us to uh, to put on our uh, wait. What are they called? Vestments. Vestments. T time for us to put on our vestments." And he said, you Protestant boys can go put your choir robes on over there. <laughs> <laughs> See? See? <laughs> See? Yeah, I mean, it's still happening, happening in the day. Yeah. Yeah, second class citizens. When I did my, my aunt's funeral, she was a very devout Catholic. And in, in the, the Catholic, Catholic Church, Church, at least in North, North Jersey, Jersey uh, they do the, uh, the eulogy and all the talking about the family at the visitation the night before and then at the funeral service it's just a pure service there's no talking about the deceased or anything like that other than putting their name in the prayers you know fill in the blank and you put your name in the prayers and they use the he or she uh, you know one or the other and uh, when, I, when my aunt died and I, I knew the priest there because uh, he was a family friend he allowed me in the pulpit during the funeral service, the funeral mass, to get up and do a good Protestant eulogy. And I was so impressed with that. But that's because nowadays things are a little looser, uh, choir robes uh, notwithstanding. Uh, and, uh, but when I got out, my first question was, I know my aunt prayed every night that I would become a priest. And I know she did. And uh, I said, but that didn't work out, but at least I'm on the B team. <laughs> and it got a good laugh from everybody because he introduced me as a Presbyterian minister. So. Uh, to close out here, uh, one of the things I say in the book is that one good way of understanding inspiring grace, of taking that grace and then, you know, showering it on others is uh, the whole concept of paying it forward. And you may remember that movie. How many of you saw the movie or read the book by Catherine Hyde that the movie was based on? Uh, it's a wonderful movie. Hallie Jo Osmond does a wonderful job. And it's a kid who uh, the teacher gives an assignment, you know, come back with uh, an idea that can change the world. So without uh, getting into the, the, uh, the plot of the movie, uh, the kid uh, comes back and he, and he comes up with this idea of paying it forward. And paying it forward is basically this. He, he writes this on the board. And he says it has to be something that really helps people. Something they can't do for themselves. I do it for them. They do it for three other people. Something, same thing. And these are the rules of paying it forward. And the idea of that is, is the, uh, not the, uh, what is the interest that, not compounding interest, you know, builds on top of each other, exponential curve and all that, where, you know, one person does it for three, they go out and do it for three others, and now we're up to nine, and then it just keeps going and going and going. And the whole movie is about, uh, this little boy doing some good things to three people and then they do it for others. And it's a very sweet movie, but it's also uh, uh, kind of a heartbreaking movie as well. His mother's alcoholic and, uh, and, and in the movie, you know, that has a big impact on this. Uh, it's a very neat thing. But the paying it forward is something that's been around for a long time. It just, this book picked up on that and ran with it. The blessings multiply when we pay inspiring faith forward, inspiring grace rather. And then you add, well, is that a biblical thing or just a cool, you know, a cultural thing or somebody's idea? And, and, and I found in Luke 6, um, we, we get a little bit of that. There's a lot of it in the Bible. A lot of it is with Abraham. You know, you're a blessing to others that we've talked about. 
But in Luke 6 it says, give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and pouring into your lap. Luckily, it's not hot coffee. (laughs) The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. But then we go up to the top line again, and it's give, and then you'll receive. So you give, you get back, you give some more, you get back, you give some more, and it just piles up and piles up and piles up. And, and, And in a modern way, paying it forward is kind of a a simple way of thinking about it. The Spirit inspires us to share the grace of our triune God. And I like this picture of, uh, here's this uh, huge, huge basketball player. (laughs) Uh, And look at his coach, and he's paying it forward. And when he was in college, and now Jabbar is you know, now Jabbar is kind of an elder statesman of many things now. Uh, and Kareem is there with his coach. I forget the name of the UCL. Who, Wooden? Is it Wooden? Yeah, I, I knew I knew it. I just forgot. But I thought of the picture. I said, that's perfect. That's perfect for that. Inspiring grace moves us to pass on grace to others. And then... Uh, The next few slides basically say the same thing. Those who bless others will be abundantly blessed. Those who help others are helped, says Proverbs. I like the book of Proverbs. There are some issues with paying it forward. Uh, This is just a meme. They just got a picture of the guy from the office, Steve Carell. Uh, but I like what, what the meme says. It says, when people are doing pay it forward in the drive through but there's a minivan in your rearview mirror. <laughs> I could just picture filled with, like, you know, the, the baseball team. You know, the, the t-ball team is back there jammed up, and this stands here. <laughs> but paying it for, forward, according to Timothy Witt, these are his comments here. Paying it forward has been part of the Christian lifestyle since the very beginning. Live a life filled with love, following the examples of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a blessing, a blessed aroma, a pleasing aroma for God. And the second is like it, Jesus said, and, it, and in Matthew's gospel, you know, love your neighbor as you love yourself. True Christianity is a pay it forward, no strings attached, self, selfless lifestyle, just as God intended. Jesus is paraphrased saying, uh, just as I have done, go and do likewise. And what's amazing to me is when I you know, watch the evening news uh, and, and see some of the stuff going on in the Ukraine and Poland and uh, you know, accepting the refugees and those uh, organizations going in. And, and, and it just reminds me of this whole, you know, they're living out that lifestyle, paying it forward. These are people that don't have to do anything. They don't have to go down to the border and help people uh, come across and, you know, bring baby food to children and diapers and uh, or open their home to, you know, refugee families or open their church and be there, you know, 10 hours a day helping. These people don't have to do that. Our missions uh, agency, uh, the Presbyterian Foundation, uh, the Outlook Foundation, what is it? The Outreach, Outreach Foundation. uh, is doing that, working with uh, churches and pastors on both sides of the board. They don't have to do that. They could do other stuff, uh, but they're there doing it. And it's costing them so much, but they're paying it forward. Here's your assignment. And I haven't been collecting homework, as you've noticed. So <laughs> this is Good. the honor system here, but... I'm hoping you'll try a little exercise of paying it forward. And I did it, but it's, a, uh, it's not an easy one. I, I picked numbers, the, the blessing in the Old Testament. But it comes in three. It comes in, uh, there's three phrases to that. 
And my challenge to you is to read this over, over the week, maybe for your devotional time, jot down some things, and uh, pray and seek out each blessing, how that might impact your own life today. And then can you think of ways to pass on these blessings to pay it forward to others this week? May the Lord bless and keep you. That's the first the second is, may the Lord let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the third phrase, may the Lord look upon you kindly and give you peace. Now, how's that, how's that wonderful blessing of grace impact you? And how might you find a way to kind of let others experience that? Through a kind word, a card, a phone call, an email, maybe a visit, maybe a gift. You know, I don't, I don't know. It's up to you, but just it's your challenge. So thank you all for coming out, and I appreciate it.